So, um, starting with that, it's um, myself and Ashley were thinking about these questions, and we thought, well, maybe we can look at some examples and some case studies and look at how that's actually been happening, maybe some directions for the future or considerations. Um, and I think we'll find that there's, there's, there's a lot of great stuff happening and there's a lot of things that could maybe happen in the future as well. But first of all, what is 3D digital recording? I think there's so much expertise in that um, evident at this conference. I won't go into this too much. But basically, we're talking about, uh, I've got some examples from a site, I believe that is um, Shuttle there, yeah. Um, and you also got a thing on the bottom which is talking about uh, one of the methods, which is laser scanning and some of the parameters. And one of the things you can see from that is that there's lots of metrics, there's lots of quantitative data that you can use to evaluate exactly how you proceeded with most of the 3D scanning um, technologies and that's quite useful in terms of comparing one to another and, and, and where you are with it. Um, but basically what we're talking about is dimensional 3D dimensional data capture using either some type of electromagnetic spectrum, so use your visible light, laser light, it could be uh, other, other parts of the spectrum as well, but your basic idea is doing a kind of range finder technique where you're looking at the distance between points and you're measuring uh, usually in a semi-automatic <coughs> process, and that can also include things like photogrammetry, where you're basing it off of actual digital photos. Um, so examples could be laser scanning, photogrammetry, structure from motion, which tends to be things like using drones to capture images, um, and then basing the digital models off of that. Um, also, um, white light scanning, sometimes known as structured light, um, and you could also include things like the ferro arm, which are uh, sometimes called contact metrology, type of solutions. Um, so basically these type of data sets have to then be processed into models which can be used for lots of applications of valuing the site. Um, not a new technology at all. Uh, aspects of this, particularly photogrammetry, have been around for many, many decades, but the uh, increase in computing power and resolution and technology has really made it a lot more available than ever before. So I think it's fair to say it's been using, being used in archaeology for some years. I think conservation, specific conservation applications are a bit newer, particularly if you're talking about lab-based object conservation, um, but even on site in terms of um, how well that's being integrated into the whole picture, I think is still very actively developing, which is exciting. Um, let's go here. Um, just really quickly to say, um, while I can have a look while I'm mentioning, that there is quite a workflow involved and some of this can be automated during the process um, but a lot of times um, there is user input that has to happen during the process. The most important thing is planning what you actually want to record, what are your research questions, what are your operational needs, um, whether it's for conservation or archaeology and I think that's the stage at which you really determine um, what the outcome is going to be and I think sometimes there's too much of a tendency to say got this brilliant kit, let's turn it on, take a scan at whatever parameters are recommended, and then you've got your data set. And I think that's not necessarily the best way to look at it. But just to say, after that, there's usually the scanning event itself, where you're actually capturing the data, processing, which often uses quite a lot of computer power, and goes through various points of creating point clouds and polygons and all of that. This is probably quite familiar to many of you. Um, and then you've got to store and archive the data and I think crucially have a really good way of, of uh, accessing it, querying it, and being able to meaningful, meaningfully use that data at the end. Um, but what, what can it do for archaeology? We've kind of heard about this or touched on already, but obviously it can be very accurate, relatively rapid 3D recording of sites or features including stratigraphy, um, different techniques have slightly different resolutions, but you can certainly get sub-millimeter accuracy with some of them. Laser scanning is not necessarily the most accurate in all cases, um, and it isn't necessarily the cheapest either, but it certainly has been used very effectively, along with increasingly photogrammetry and drone-based uh, work as well. Um, but basically, one of, the, one of the big advantages of it is you can sometimes do recording in quite challenging conditions, including underwater archaeology, 
um, you know, very challenging lighting conditions and uh, foreshore and all that sort of thing where you, would, you wouldn't necessarily have very easy access to do physical measurements in a, in, a, in a more traditional sense, even if you wanted to approach it that way. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to that. It can be geolocated, uh, incorporated into GIS systems, and of course, increasingly things like building information models, which you heard about a little bit yesterday. Um, and it is important to note, to note that 3D digital recording is not the whole picture of something like a BIM database, but it is a lot of the data that can be used to build into that, of course. Um, it can also in aid interpretation of the site or elements of it, and of course you've heard a lot about post-presentation and of the site to the public, and that can be quite an important aspect of that, whether it's uh, for understanding it or basically um, leading to whether it's enhanced reality, virtual reality, all sorts of technologies to present the site as well. Um, in terms of conservation, what can it do? Because we've, we've thought a lot about archaeology, conservation. Um, the thing with, with uh, this is that um, it can be a faster, better way of recording a lot of the type of information that conservators normally do when they do a condition assessment um, of an object or a structure. So um, you've got some examples here where you, you've got, uh, I think on the top, you've got uh, an elevation map of the building in Pompeii. And this is part of a very large project using many different modalities of scanning um, to, to build very detailed, comprehensive models. So in this case, you're doing it with a structure. The one here is actually a vessel. It's a pewter vessel from a marine archaeological site called Grosslike uh, from 1740. And it's, you can see the roughness caused by the corrosion products which have built up on the surface. So you can actually map things like cracks, corrosion, uh, and, and all kinds of physical features, including original technological features as well. So you've got those two. So basically, you can do active 3D recording. Again, um, you can fe detect features that you might not have seen easily with, with just the eye alone, um, find technological information, which can also feed into archaeological interpretations, um, and a host of other things. But one of the really powerful things that it can do is to allow you to review the data um, with colleagues, even, even remotely, have discussions about the condition of the object and what the best way forward might be in terms of its conservation strategy. Um, and I think that's where it starts to become more powerful, even more so when you've got the data from a 3D uh, scan you can then build that into more complex models, such as BIM, if you've got something a bit larger, but also things like finite element analysis, which is uh, from engineering, where you're actually using it to build structural models, predict things like um, load capacity, if it's a structural uh, uh, feature. And that allows you to do, make some really important decisions about how to take care of the structure of the object. So there. Um, just to say really quick, this is how I can see it fitting into the conservation picture, um, kind of at the beginning, and then you've got sort of conservation treatments, whether it be active stabilization or preventive approaches. You often want to evaluate how well that's worked, um, and then um, at the end, you might want to do a bit more using the 3D models again. Okay, very briefly I mentioned the Rosewhite project and this is an example of how a current marine archaeological excavation has been using 3D scanning of its objects that have been recovered during the project uh, as, as standard procedure. So you've got a white light scanning of a copper alloy lamp going on here. Um, and this is a, a historic wreck which has been excavated uh, starting last summer. Um, and one of the really interesting things that we did with this is, and this is actually in, in a lot of ways very, very similar to the work in Jersey with the coin hoard. Um, one of the problems with marine archaeological objects is they often form concretions, which are very hard crusts uh, forming around particularly iron objects and the corrosion and the calcareous crust that forms around that often makes a, a combination of a lot of objects stuck together. And there's also a spatial relationship between those objects. Um, and that's important for the archaeological interpretation as well as, as understanding how to approach the conservation. 
Problem is, during conservation, we would normally remove this crust, allow better access to the object, better uh, possibility of preserving them by doing things such as Jared was mentioned, removing salts from the iron. Um, when you do that, you lose that spatial context. And so by doing, in this case, photogrammetry, we're able to record the um, nature of this. This is a very large concretion made up of about 100 cannonballs and bar shots, as well as many other um, inorganic and organic materials. And now we've got this in, in rectified, we can actually measure any point, and we did it not only before deconcretion, but during the entire process as well. So we've now broken this down, but on Sketchfab online, you can actually see about 10 stages of that. And that's been a really nice way of doing that. So um, I think one of the things, just this is just to say, you can do some really beautiful uh, scanning jobs. This is not Rushmore. But basically to say, um, can, conser can a conservation approach to 3D recording benefit archaeology? So if you're looking at doing 3D recording, particularly of sites or larger objects, for conservation reasons, can that actually benefit archaeology in terms of archaeological data collection? And I think the answer is it can really well if you think about it from the beginning. And, and if you integrate those two into the, into the planning of the project, um, they can work hand in hand really well. There might be some things which are more important for conservation, more important for archaeology, but you can use the two together. Um, having said that, you have to be clear on what your goals are and what your research questions are. Because if you start to say, well, we don't need this resolution for that, what we do for this, you've got to think of that at the beginning. Um, and one of the one of the most difficult things to do is to use a data set that just wasn't asking that question, and then try to try to do it later. So that's uh, they can they can work together quite well. Um, a couple more examples. Um, this is the CSS Hunley, which is a um, Civil War American Civil War submarine, which was marine recovered with all of the concretion on the surface there. Um, what you can say about this is it's probably one of the most well recorded in terms of 3D imaging of any marine vessel I think that I know of. Um, and they've completely scanned inside and out, including during the excavation of the remains of the crew inside the submarine as well. Um, there's a, a 3D point cloud of it. What this has done is allow them to make engineering models of it when they did major movements of it to make sure that the structure would be safe. Um, they, they were also able to, to learn a lot about the environment the submarine was in um, by studying patterns of the concretion and learn a lot of technological information about it which was not necessarily as planned, uh, as built was not necessarily as planned and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of really interesting um, data that was learned from that. Um, if you want to go even larger scale in terms of marine recording, there's an amazing project that's been done uh, in Egypt, the Red Sea of the Thistle Gorm, a World War II wreck. This was all done with photogrammetry underwater, um, and I think there was something like uh, 13 hours of diving. Um, I think I've got the number of images that involved. Um, it, it involved very significant cloud computing resources to crunch the data. Uh, and say loading the model takes a very long time. Thank you. Um, so this shows, and this was actually done, um, it, um, it was a project with the uh, University of Nottingham, but also with the Egyptian government and universities. This is actually meant to be a baseline for understanding the condition of the site. It's not planned to do archaeology there, but I think it would also be a great starting point if there was that sort of work intended. Um, so on to an example on terrestrial with Chatal, which I won't say too much more about. Oops, there we are on that one. Because we've heard some, some great explanations at first, but you can see the site there under the shelter which exists there. Um, I think the important thing to say about this, we might have a chance, or if anyone has any questions, Ashton may be able to elaborate a bit. The important thing about, about Chatal is, uh, in terms of the way that it's been approached, is there has been a an effort to as the current archaeological excavations are winding down, uh, basically this year, I think was the last year, there is a need to kind of document what's come before and to make that available for the future, in, including of the conservation efforts of the architecture on the site. Uh, and so 
there was an excellent um, um, opportunity to kind of look at how a project, which I think is called the Chateauvieux Digital Pre uh, Preservation Project, was developed. And the idea is to collate information uh, taken by uh, primarily, I think it's, it's laser scanning and drone-based um, photographs, as well as other environmental monitoring data on the site, and basically make those available. So you've got both legacy information, including older 2D photographs and 3D scans, with more current information, and basically those are all available um, through, oh, let's go back in a second. Those are all available through the modality of an app, which is actually designed to be possible to access um, via smartphones. And the idea is that the information has to be accessible. If it isn't accessible, then there really isn't an awful lot of point in collecting it all, particularly, and there's been some interesting discussion about that in other papers here at TAG. But the idea that um, you have to have a way of querying the data and bringing up the information that you want, comparing how a section of the site looks today to how it did last year, going back and scanning again. So did the conservation methodology that was employed, um, has that succeeded in stabilizing the site a bit, or is there still movement happening? All those things are easier to look at when you can compare the images taken at different times and different data sets. Um, so one of the really um, amazing things that was done with this is there was a particular sculptural um, head, and I think possibly some of our colleagues could say more about this, um, but basically this is a, a plaster sculpture, um, and it was found, I believe, um, after the fact, but by looking at the scans, it was possible to, to determine exactly how it fit into the context and to actually use that information to learn more about the archaeology and the conservation and to, um, to inform the way that it was preserved on the site. Um, basically, there are some challenges with it, um, with 3D digital capture for conservation or archaeology. But both, um, again, data is only good as research questions and the planning that was done. Data sets can be very, very large. Um, format, archiving, and retrieval can be difficult challenges in terms of the physical computing equipment. Um, there, there's a little bit of a training gap and a lack of common language between those who kind of produce the equipment and, and, the, um, and the software, and archaeologists and conservators and other users. And getting those people to all talk the same language and work effectively together can be a bit challenging at times. Um, part of that is a, is a training issue and the fact that we could have more integration of 3D recording training into archaeology and conservation uh, training courses as well as, as practice on site. Um, and the other thing is that it can be very time consuming. It can take an awful lot of time from hands-on work by conservators and by excavators as well. It can certainly make the argument that it's well worth it, um, but if you have a size of team that allows specialization, keeping all this running while other things go on, it's ideal. If you don't, it can be a challenge to keep it all going. Um, there's one other point I'd like to try to make before we finish, and that is there is um, a perceived lack of interpretive elements. And this is where we might get into slight theory here. I realize it's been a little light so far on the theoretical aspects. Um, and there are two ways you could talk about that. One is the fact that people tend to look at um, the result of a 3D digital scan, which is produced by an automated system such as a laser <coughs> scanner, and saying, okay, brilliant, that's objective. That's actually something which is probably uh, closer to representing the actual site or object uh, than, say, a drawing made by an archaeologist. Um, but that depends, because you have cases where actually the data state is incomplete, there are gaps in the model, so it wouldn't really be a watertight model, if you'd like to say it that way. Uh, and then sometimes some people actually fill those in using various algorithms, okay? Um, and that would actually essentially mean that they've not scanned as thoroughly as, as they could have, but it's kind of been fudged a bit. Um, and so sometimes the appearance of these data sets can be very, very good, but they're actually not quite as accurate as they seem. Another way you can take that is 
whether or not some modalities may be better than others. And I'll just leave you with the Newport Medieval Ship, which some of you may be familiar with. And in this case, along with some other maritime uh, projects I'm aware of, they've actually chosen to do a lot of the recording with a contact neutrality system like the Faro Arm, because there is or can be a certain amount of interpretive element similar to what you would get with archaeological illustration by hand, in the sense that the archaeologist or the conservator can note details and can actually choose to make sure they're represented in an active, deliberate choice, whereas they may or may not show up in a scan which essentially um, is an automatic process. So that's, an, uh, that's a kind of maybe theoretical argument you could have as to which is better. Um, some people would say if the technology is good enough, eventually we won't need to have that kind of active process and save time and all that kind of thing. Um, other people might say it, it's crucial uh, to have that, and it does allow a little bit more um, possibility for the um, kind of reflexive process of archaeology and conservation to get into the results as well. So thank you so much. Just to say, believing that it's an evolving process, and um, there's, there's, there's some more and more guidelines coming out about it, but I think Going back to our original question, was it an evolution or a revolution? Um, I think in many sense it's evolution because you're looking at more sophisticated ways of recording the same kind of information that conservators and archaeologists would have wanted to do in the past, uh, better and faster than before. Um, but the idea about why you're recording it and what you need to know about the object are really kind of, there's a continuity there in terms of practice. So it is kind of an evolution. However, if you do use data sets in a very specific, uh, sophisticated way, such as to create large comprehensive models, share that data with everyone, and make active decisions about conservation of sites and objects uh, from that, this is really kind of something you couldn't really do before in the same way, um, such as the fact um, that you know, things like finite element analysis and building information models are, are changing the way that people look at data from sites. So I think that there is a revolutionary aspect of it uh, as well. It's just one of those things where possibly a mixed methods approach is sometimes still appropriate. So thank you.